In this first segment, um, we're welcoming Rosalind Hayes, who is with the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network. And we were thinking particularly at this time of year during the holidays when um, a, lot of gets, a lot gets stirred up for folks around holidays. Um, so we thought this would be a good topic and a good resource for the community. And also, as we move into our discussion later, uh, we'll be talking about some coalition work that we're doing. So welcome, Rosalind. Thank you. Um, the first question I have for you is, uh, this room today is full of passionate people, and I am going to guess that there's a passion that you have for the work that you do, and could you tell your story? Sure. There is a definite passion I have for the work that I do um, because the work that I do is based in my lived experience. And so just a little bit about me. Um, as far as it relates to the work that I do, I was someone who... Uh, eight years ago I was homeless living on the streets of Atlanta. I'm someone with a 20-year history of substance abuse and some mental health challenges. Um, I went into my last treatment program probably eight years ago and it was during this time that uh, someone introduced me to the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network and I found out that I currently, at the time, I was working at a at a thrift store, working a minimum wage job. I think at the time the, the salary was $6.50 an hour. Um, and it, it was so crushing because that was the amount of money I had made on the very first job I had ever had in my life 20 years prior to that time. Um, but I was happy because I was drug free. Um, and during this time I was introduced to the certified the Georgia CPS Project, which is Georgia Certified Peer Support Specialist. And so I went through that training um, and I found out that all of the things that I had been through, that they were valuable. The things that I thought would be barriers to my having gainful employment uh, turned out with the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network. Those were the very things that made me a viable candidate for employment. And so I went through the through the training, I became a certified peer specialist. I went to work for the Peer Support Wellness and Respite Center in Decatur uh, in 2010. Um, I went as a part-time employee, got promoted to full-time in a very short amount of time. I became the assistant director of the Wellness Center and then uh, went on to the position that I have currently, which is that of statewide coordinator for the Peer Support Wellness and Respite Centers. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for sharing that powerful story. Um, so, the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network is a mouthful. Can you can you break that down for us? The GMHCN, Georgia Peer Support. I'll oh, see. I'm messing up now. The Georgia Mental Health <laughs> Consumer Network. Uh, it was founded in 1991. Uh, came out of a meeting of about 30 people who were disgusted and upset with the treatment that people, you know, with disabilities, with mental health challenges, with substance use challenges receive. Um, and it seems that, that that fight still goes on. But the network came into existence in 1991. Again, uh, came out of a meeting of about 30 people. We now, under the uh, leadership of Sherry Jenkins Tucker, we've grown to have more than 500 members. Uh, we started out 25 years ago um, having a consumer conference, a statewide consumer conference, um, and we still have that 25 years later. It's one of the largest in the country. Uh, it's down in St. Simons every year. Um, and we went from being, you know, hat sponsoring this conference to now having several different projects under the network umbrella including the Peer Support Wellness and Respite Centers. Um, and just to say a bit about that, uh, respite, the idea of respite is an alternative to psychiatric hospitalization, uh, believing that it is a preventative tool for people. You know, we believe that each person is an expert on themselves and that we know better than anybody else when, you know, life is getting a little bit unmanageable. And that would be the time for a person to access respite. Um, it's a pretty new idea. We're probably 
25 respite centers around the country and Georgia is lucky enough to have five of those 25 centers here in our state. So um, I really wanted to talk more about the philosophy behind the work that you do and if you could explain the difference between the traditional medical model and the more peer-driven one that you're, you're involved in. Sure, we are a peer-driven movement. We are, the wellness centers for example, are, and the network, everyone that works for the network, I'd say 98% of the people who work for the network are people living with some sort of mental health challenge or in recovery. Um, and the idea with the traditional system it's more coercive, you know, it's more, you know, you have a, a group of people who have gone to school and studied psychology, psychology, uh, sociology things, of, you know, social workers, whatever. You have those folks who have lots of education, um, who get to make the decisions about what's best for people living with these different challenges. When you come into a peer-driven system, you have people who actually have had the experience um, supporting other people living with those same types of challenges. And so, you know, something that happens in traditional systems is you have a whole, you know, you have treatment teams. So you have all these people that sit around and they make decisions about what's in the best interest of an indiv individual. Uh, and a lot of times they never even ask that individual what they want or what kind of life they might like to have. Um, and so for us, we come from a perspective that each person is an expert on themselves and that, you know, I know, I know how I feel on the inside and I know what my wants, my desires, my dreams are. And just because, you know, I've had mental health challenges, just because I've had substance use challenges, does not mean that I don't still have hopes, dreams, desires, and aspirations. You know, it doesn't mean that recovery is not possible. And the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network and the work that we do, it's all about promoting recovery. And, you know, the fact is that people do get better. People do return and, and have meaningful, full lives, you know. Like I said, eight years ago, I was homeless. You know, now I'm a homeowner. Um, I was, eight years ago, I was unemployable. You know, now I've been on my job for six years and continue to be promoted. And, and my story is not unique, you know. I work with people who have been on receiving uh, social security checks. They've been on disability for years and years and years. And through their experience with the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network, either as participating in some of our programs or as employees, um, people have decided, you know, I don't want to be on disability anymore. They can keep their check. I want to work a full-time job and, you know, I want to pay my own way. Um, so I, I, see, I get to see miracles happen every single day, you know, and self-direction is a huge part of the way it works, you know. Um, taking personal responsibility for what, whatever my situation is, and then being allowed to make decisions about what I want, you know. Um, and it's amazing because so many times, you know, I ask people, you know, well, what is it, what, what is it that you hope, say, to achieve while you're in respite? And that, I, that question blows people away because no one's ever asked them what they wanted before. And so it was real hard for them to answer because they never had to think about it because that choice, what is it that you want, has never been asked. That question has never been available. So rather than uh, treating someone as a patient in sort of an objectifying way, <laughs> it, it sounds like mm -hmm. what you're talking about is that everyone has a has a means to empower themselves that just has to be kind of nurtured. It has to be tapped into. People are people first. You know, people are not walking problems. They're not walking diagnoses or anything like that. But oftentimes, once a person gets into the mental health system and they get that label, then that's the thing that they're known by and that's the thing that follows them every place that they go, you know. Could you say a little more about that? Because just in terms of the language, Tracy and I were talking about this a few weeks ago, it's just a shift. Oh, yeah. And Noel did explain that to us. Language, to say, go language ahead. is huge. And the way that we talk about each other and the way that we talk about ourselves 
makes all of the difference. And so if I can get up and talk about my experience in human experience language, okay, so everybody has emotions, everybody has feelings, everybody can connect at that level. So if I tell my story and my story is full of labels and diagnoses and medication that I can't even pronounce, what that does is it, it creates stigma because people don't understand. But if I can talk about you know, having, rather than saying, well, I suffer from major depression, I might say, first of all, I don't suffer from anything. I live with my challenges. I'm not suffering with these things. I'm living with these things. And if I can talk about, say, my depression in terms of being in a really dark place or being, you know, in a hole that I never thought I'd get out of, you know, are experiencing an extreme amount of pain because pain is at the root of a lot of what people go through. Um, but if I can talk about it in human experience language, other people can connect to that because, you know, whether it's been something that you've experienced for a prolonged amount of time or for just a short amount of time, you know, when you experience a, a loss, you know, that, that, that depth, that pain, that darkness that, that a person feels, you know, at the loss of a parent, at the loss of a child, at the loss of, you know, whatever it might be, um, people can connect with those emotions. Whereas if I start talking about, you know, oh, well, my mania, if I say, I'll, you know, it's the best day of my life, I was super excited, people can relate to that. You know, the birth of your child, you, you know, you're on top of the world, you know. So if I can talk about being on top of the world rather than being manic, because nobody knows what that means, and that scares people. And so, you know, those words, those medical terms, they separate us. And they say, you know, oh, I don't know what they, they're talking about. That's scary. You stay over there. If I can talk about it in human experience language, people can say, well, yeah, I can connect to that. Yeah. Well, thank you. This is very helpful. Um, so with the time we have left in this piece, um, with the holidays coming up, like I said before, I think people um, under can sometimes be under a lot of stress. And if you could give our listeners some resources uh, anything, Facebook, phone number, whatever you have. Yes. Um, the easiest way to access all of what the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network has to offer is to go to the website at gmhcn.org. Now, there will be a link over on the left-hand left side for respite centers. And in addition to being a place where people can come and actually stay for up to seven days, one of the other things that we offer is a 24-7 warm line where people can call in and get peer support over the telephone. We actually, like I mentioned, have five centers around the state, so that means you have five different warm lines that people can call throughout the day to connect and just talk. Um, and I speak of it as a warm line versus a hot line because, you know, if a person is in, you know, if they're dealing with a real crisis, then we're able to transfer those calls over to the Georgia Crisis and Access Line. But if, you know, you're just needing to talk to somebody. You know, people, when we get labeled, when we get diagnoses, a lot of times our friends and family, they go away from us. Um, and so we're there, like I said, 24-7, 24, 24 we're there to answer the phone and offer peer support. Also, if you're able, if you're in an area close to one of our wellness centers, we have one in, in Decatur, one in Bartow County, one in White County up in the North Georgia Mountains, uh, one in Henry County, one in Colquitt County. We actually will be there on Christmas Day celebrating. We celebrate every holiday to be a place for people who don't have those family connections to come and be a part of that recovery community. Um, it, it's a really... Roz, That's a really call? awesome thing. Roz, what's the call number? The call-in number that uh, people can call in? It's a um, you can call the Decatur number is 404-371-1414. And if you call that number, they will share with you the numbers of the other four warm lines. Okay. okay, and we will do, please do that again at the end. Sure. Uh, okay, so we're ready to take a break and uh, we'll be back. 
Hi, we're back. Um, in this segment, we are going to be talking about the coalition that just started. Um, and this coalition started up, this work started up around the death of Anthony Hill. Anthony Hill was a veteran who served many tours in Afghanistan and he came back home to be murdered by DeKalb County Officer Robert Olson. Um, Anthony suffered from mental illness and looking at a lot of these cases where uh, these brothers were killed by police, we are beginning to see a pattern of disability, a pattern of some type of mental illness or just some type of disability whether it be hearing or processing and so this coalition was started with Disabilities Link, uh, Black Lives Matter, NAACP, um, the group that Roz just talked about, Georgia Mental Health, and several different organizations that we'll talk to. Tracy is here today from Tracy. I'm Local 732, and I'm also an incoming board member at Disability Link. Yes, and Ken is also here. And I'm from uh, Disability Link. I'm the Disability Rights uh, Manager. Right. So um, the discussion we wanted to get into was about the work of this coalition and, um, and why we need to make changes in policy so that what happened to Anthony Hill never happens again. So does anybody want to start in terms of what they, ch what changes they think uh, we've been discussing and what need, needs to happen? This is Ken. Uh, I guess for me, um, it has a uh, personal um, center. I um, happen to be a black male. I happen to be a veteran. I happen to be a person with a disability. I have, uh, I'm blind. Um, so, many of those uh, things that uh, correlate with uh, Mr. Hill uh, obviously correlate with myself. And one of the things that we had just talked about in the last meeting, we were talking about uh, some of the things that uh, a person uh, with those characteristics might have as they're walking down the street, or, or the cautions that uh, have been given to a person like myself, you know. Make sure that, you know, uh, if you stop by the police, for instance, you show your hands, that you don't be con confrontive, that you, you know, sir, and all that kind of good stuff. Where, uh, and some other person, those uh, characteristics might not be as needed. Um, of course, you would be courteous to anybody, but uh, you don't get that, uh, quote unquote, the talk. And so uh, that's one of the conversations we started out with last week. Tracy? Um, we were also looking in the facts that uh, a lot of times when there is some type of um, issue with the person that has suffered with mental illness, when people call for help for them, the, the first instance is that they send the police first. And we're wanting to get um, an organization, organization started where they will dispatch a crisis center um, affiliate or someone with that type of training and or get the police better trained on how to respond to mental health issues instead of coming um, I would say almost like guns blazing but um, it's, it's very scary to ask for help and when you ask for help they send the police and the police not necessarily come wanting to help. What's exciting to me about being on this um, panel or this uh, committee or coalition is the fact that um, I'm in Black Lives Matter and so I am an abolitionist and we're going to be hearing that m word more and more about abolition and uh, the ending of policing as we know it. The exciting part about this is the notion that this is the beginning of something that could be put in place to start ending that system of policing. 
if we can have medical responders come out, if we can have trained people who can de-escalate to come out, to me this is the beginning of the end of that. And so as an abolitionist, I'm excited about it because I can see the abolishment of a system that has oppressed us for so long. Russ? Uh, one of the trainings provided by the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network is a mental health first aid training, and that is for first responders, for police, firemen, people in the community to learn how to respond in these situations. So, and, and I know that the officer who, who killed uh, Anthony Hill had some training, obviously not enough, but had some training. Um, also, uh, the Georgia Crisis and Access Line, Behavioral Health Link, they, they're, they're a resource that we use uh, with the Peer Support Wellness and Respite Centers if we need a higher level of intervention. Um, and they do have mobile crisis teams, you know. It, it's not our practice. We never want to call the police on a peer. And so we would call the Georgia Crisis and Access Line. They are, you know, s staffed with, uh, you know, professionals, they're, ever, they're able to do assessments over the telephone and they are, you know, they'll send out a mobile crisis unit to meet with the individual, to talk with them and then to make determinations about what needs to happen after that. So the idea of getting peers in, you know, into, into uh, emergency rooms and getting peers into, you know, situations with the police so that they could maybe be a go-between or a liaison of sorts between, you know, the individual in crisis and the police who are the police. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly that. Yeah, I have a, um, a deep fear that's it's something that people shouldn't live with, is that every time um, my son leaves home, he's, um, I have a 25-year-old male, black, that is living with um, MID, mild intellectual disorder. So every time he leaves home, I'm fearful that if he's stopped by the police that he might not respond quick enough or respond in a proper manner and that I won't see my kid any, again ever. So I, this is one of the main reasons why I joined Disability Link and why I joined this coalition because I wanted to be able to find ways to have a better um, the policing as uh, was stated before, we, we got to figure out a better way to respond to getting help for people that need help and when they interact, period, with people and people of color. So that's what pushes me. And I think that th the point that, that Tracy, you just made and that Ken made is we're talking about a fear-based fear society where so much of what went around the table, Rosalind, was stories like Tracy's where people have relatives and their concerned, loved ones that they're concerned something bad is going to happen to. And then, so in response to living under these conditions, people are doing what Ken's talking about, having to figure out how they have to adjust their behavior in order to survive. So we, we've got we've to make a change. But one of the things that I, you know, I heard in the segment before, which I enjoy so much is that um, we're talking about we, the people with disabilities, are the experts in our own lives. And it just seems to make sense if we are the experts in our own lives that we're part of the solution. We are uh, the, 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 the lead instead of having uh, others uh, control uh, pretty much everything. So, for instance, um, uh, through the Georgia Mental Health uh, Network, we know that. Um, one of the first things they would uh, do is uh, uh, respond with peers, uh, peer support, because there's people going through this and people will know that people are the experts. And uh, where the police base uh, is um, uh, more of, um, at this particular point in time, uh, restraining and uh, securing instead of serving and protecting. When we say serve and protect, we're talking about everybody, not just uh, the surrounding people, but actually the, the uh, person that uh, actually needs the, uh, the service at that particular time. So it's important that, uh, I know, uh, I think it was Tracy was just talking about uh, that the police officer had some training, but my question would be, uh, in the training that he received, how much was that was led by a peer-led organization, by people who uh, 
not only have dealt with this uh, but live with it. And my last point that I have to put in here is that we, you know, we talk about experts, we talk about the medical model, we talk about someone who's gone and got their doctorate, let's say. So they went and got a bachelor that took four years, master's maybe that took two more years, maybe a doctor took them four more years. So well, we got ten years of, of uh, experience. Well, um, I've lived with a disability for 62 years, and that's a lot more experience, I would think, uh, every day than uh, any person with a, a doctorate. Not saying they don't know stuff, not saying they don't know um, different things, and there are experts in some stuff, so we do need support from those organizations, from those people, from the academics, from the police, or whatever. But the lead must be people with disabilities. Uh, if we, uh, we are the people with the most investment, we are the people that uh, have to be part of the solution. So Ken, um, you know I was going to ask you, uh, what is the independent living philosophy? <laughs> and, and in the context of this story, how, how does that, and, and maybe Rosalind can help too, ideally what kind of um, situation do we want for people so they can live independently? So Rosalind's story earlier is exactly what the independent philosophy in my mind is, and that is we, the people with disabilities, are uh, the experts in our own life. We, uh, we have choices, uh, and we are responsible for the choices that we make, whatever that is. And so often or not, uh, people with disabilities are dismissed. And uh, we know, even by academic data, that when it's person-centered and uh, person-centered philosophy, we know that the uh, results are, uh, are better. There are, there's more solutions for those uh, results. And I'll let Rosin uh, chime in if you'd like to. Um, I would say that when you talk about like a housing first kind of situation, that it's really difficult for anything else to happen when you're focused on survival. Um, where am I going to sleep? What am I going to eat? When, when it is reduced, and there are so many cases, like I mentioned, I, I'm someone who, you know, live on the streets. And when, you know, my, my concern is where am I going to sleep and what am I going to eat, then recovery and all of those other things become less likely. Um, if people are able to have some sense of stability and some sense of community, then recovery is a whole lot more likely to happen. Um, and if I can switch gears a little bit, you talked about fear. Um, I live with that fear myself. You know, I'm someone who, again, I lived on the streets. I've had run-ins with the police. I, you know, and, and I abide by the same types of things that Ken talked about. You know, I don't have a whole bunch of conversation. Here's my driver's license. Mm -hmm. You know, just, you know, can we just get out of here without anything happening, you know? And I'll say on November 9th of 2016 that I had just a, 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 like an impending sense of doom after the last election about what was going to happen. And I've never felt more fearful for my personal safety than on that day. Um, and so... You're not alone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah. So, so Tracy, um, could you say a little about the, the Amalgamated Transit Union and what you do uh, at MARTA and why disability rights matters to you? Well, I'm a, actually a mobility operator and I'm from the local 732. I am a operator that was outsourced by a company called MV. And that is the, the system that picks up the disabled, that transports them and gives them the same abilities to be able to have their own transportation, where they need to go and get there safely and whatnot. And I've driven this bus for over 11 and a half years, and everyone on that bus has become my family. So to watch the system be outsourced in lieu of good, um, better service, it's, it's disheartening because I'm, I'm hearing stories and watching people that I care about that I got so, so connected with because of having different disabled people that's in my family. I have a family living with uh, schizophrenia, uh, MS, um, my son with MID, and it's just to watch them struggle even harder to get their transportation. 
that's what makes me want to be involved with Disability Link. That's what makes me um, push and try and fight against outsourcing and fight against um, injustices of the disabled because they picked on the weakest link. They, they, they consider us as disabled people or, or people of family, of family members of disabled people as the weakest link, as though as if where we need to get to don't matter. So get there however you can. So I'm, I'm fighting for, for the little man, for the little woman, for uh, my, my disabled um, special needs kids that I normally drive and we sing on the bus and we, you know, when I, I, I miss them because I hadn't been on the bus in so long, I actually snuck and went to one of the centers that they were at just to go and visit them because I got just that attached to them. They became mine. And I, I, I didn't get stuck at my job where I couldn't go on anywhere else in the department. I felt like because there was different things that I couldn't help my son with, I stayed within the department that helped the disabled to push positive out into the universe so that positive can come back to my son. And positive came back to him. He got his first job on his own, you know, with no extra avenues or anything at 25 years old on my birthday, of course, but you know, that was an extra gift. But th that's what my fight is about, is helping. And then you know, I have a brother-in-law that's autistic, you know, and the, the, where his father and mother have been very active in, in that fight for autism and everything. And it's just, we gotta do better. We gotta do better and love everybody the same. Don, can you say what, I don't know if this is too soon to talk about what happened this weekend in terms of what you learned that might apply to this discussion? Uh, we have been working this weekend. I went up to Highlander uh, for the Black Lives Matter regional, southern regional convening. And it's so many issues, so many issues that affect our people regionally here in the south that we have to break through. Like we, we have no choice right now at this moment but to fight. Like our backs are up against the wall and there is nothing else to do but fight. You know, so we have to come out and we have to organize around all of these issues. Whether it be gentrification, whether it be um, the policing in our communities that go along with that, whether it be low wages, whether it be uh, fighting for disabled rights. Um, it's just going to be a fight. And we have to come out, we have to organize, and we have to plan, and we have to be strategic in this fight. And I think the thread that's running through this conversation is that the people who have to lead that fight and the people who have yes. to come together to strategize about that fight are the people who are, at, are affected, affected the, the, most. the most. Yes. Rosa. And I just think bringing a group like this together to cre create this kind of coalition um, is very important and it's impressive because you have people who have been marginalized, whether yes. it's because we're black, whether it's because yes. we're disabled, whether it's because we're women, um, whether it's because we're people living with mental health challenges, we're all people who have been othered. And there's a lot of power because it's, it, it's a big number. Yes. That's, that's, yes. You know, you put us all together, it's a lot of us. And yes. so if we can, like you talked about, find a common thread that we've all been other, and this is a human rights issue. Yes. Um, yes. If we can coalesce around that idea, then, you know, we, we really can make a difference. Yes. So I think with the time we have, can we go around one more time in terms of what, let's talk about. Um, I think one way to combat the fear, Rosalind, is to hold on to dreams and visions of a better way things could be. So um, could we start, maybe Tracy, with if, if we make the changes that this coalition is trying to make, how would, it, how would things be different? Uh, I think just being able to know that when someone of color or, or a disabled person is leaving their home, that they will come home safe because they will be respected on the same level as everyone in this world and not be stereotyped and, and looked upon differently and treated differently. And they can have that sense of calm and not be agitated anytime they see the police. You cannot be doing anything wrong 
but if a cop gets behind you or comes up next to you, there's like a, a underlying fear that something's gonna happen and no one should have to live their lives in fear. So I'm feeling like if we get the different training, um, human uh, uh, interaction where it's compassion about I'm human, you're human, you have rights, I have rights, then we can uh, get things better. I, I spoke to a gentleman that was on my bus and he told me, he said, as soon as we as a people in this world stop judging people by what they believe religion wise or just human right wise, that you're right, you're right, I'm right, she's right, he's right, then that's when this world will be okay together. John? Um, when, we, when we look and see that 80% of the cases of black folks. I believe it was 80% mm -hmm. of the black folks that have been killed by police uh, were suffering. Well, no, I'm not going to say suffering, right? <laughs> I'm going to say we're, are, we're living with yes. uh, disability. That lets us know that the police are not keeping us safe. And they're not... Um, our encounters with the police are not safe encounters. When you look and see 80% of the people that were killed were living with disabilities, that is, that should appall us. That should make us angry. So uh, that's why I love this coalition. I believe that this is going to bring a lot to light and that we're going to change a lot of minds and that we have good ideas for things to be put in place so that our people do not have to have these interactions. Ken. <laughs> well, uh, my, uh, my thought is a little bit, uh, not towards others, but towards uh, my disability community. Uh, I'm going to first uh, say that I'm stealing most of this from Adolf Ratzka, so all due respect for him. Um, but it's a little quote that I keep in my head as often as I can, and it just goes like this. Um, as long as we regard our lives as tragedies, we will be pitied. As long as we're ashamed of who we are, our life may be considered useless. As long as we're willing to trade our convictions for convenience, we'll never be um, considered um, powerful. And last, as long as we're willing, we change that. As long as we remain silent, others will tell us what to do. Wonderfully said. Yes. So I don't know that I can add anything else to that. <laughs> so what I will do is, is remind people of the phone number to the warm line. So if you're in need of someone to talk to, you can call 404-371-1414, Peer Support Wellness and Respite Center. And the, and the website one more time? GMHCN.org, Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network.org. Okay, Ken, Disability Link. Disability Link is in uh, Tucker, Georgia. Our telephone number is 404-687-8890. And our mailing address is disabilitylink, one word, at dot .org. John? For Black Lives Matter? Oh, that's a tricky one. That's a tricky one. Okay. <laughs> Black Lives Matter Atlanta.org. Make sure that you get the right Black Lives Matter, the official Black Lives Matter chapter. Okay. <laughs> and Tracy, the Amalgamated Transit Union? Um, local ATU 732. Um, the phone number is 404-223-5122. And we're also on Facebook, I think? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, I th we have maybe two more minutes. Is there anything else that's like on people's minds or hearts that they want to say? I, I would just, that, I, that, that idea of fear. And we talked about fear on the part of, you know, the everyday, the citizens of us black folk walking around and, and whoever else, you know. But there is a lot of fear you know, the police are fearful. Uh, people are fearful of what they don't understand and what's different than them. And, you know, when we can sit down with each other and have open, honest conversations about what we really feel and what we really believe, until we can do that, um, leading from a place of fear rather than hope 
always has negative consequences. Right. Well, I want to thank uh, Rosalind for coming in today, especially because uh, we've met her now for the first time, and it's Yay. great. <laughs> Welcome to the WRFG family. Thank you. <laughs> And a can of disability link, um, and now Tracy, a new board member. So um, hopefully we'll um, be talking more about this issue in the future as we continue to make progress. And from what I hear nationally, what we're doing is very unique. What you see around this table and the other people that are involved does not exist yet anywhere else. So we may become a model, hopefully, for other people to follow. So thanks, everyone, and uh, we'll be back next Monday. Thank you. Yay. Yay.